Hi, it's Karen Q of Patriot Tours NYC, and we're here today with a tour of the Francis Tavern Museum. Last Saturday, I visited the museum to look at the Long Room. Francis Tavern Museum is currently celebrating the 50th anniversary of the restoration of the Long Room. And if you don't know already, the Long Room is the room in which George Washington gave his farewell address at the end of the Revolutionary War. So while I was there, I took a whole lot of photographs and I'm putting together a tour for you so that you can see it. And as you see, this says Francis Tavern Museum Part One because I looked at so many things that I'm going to release this as a two-part video. So part one will be the entrance to the museum, the George Washington Portrait Gallery, the George Clinton Room, and the Long Room. And part two will take on the other parts of the museum. So are you ready? Let's get started. So this is what Francis Tavern looks like if you're looking at it from Pearl Street, which is the main entrance to the building. And this building was built originally in 1719 by a family called the Delanceys. And if you know the Lower East Side, you might know a street there called Delancey Street, named for the same family. The Delanceys were a wealthy New York family. They were originally from France. They were Huguenots. Those were French Protestants who left France to escape persecution on the part of the Roman Catholic Church. So in 1719, Etienne Delancey built his family home here on the corner of Pearl and Broad Street. Um, it was originally built entirely of the little yellow bricks that you see um, on the side and around the bottom there. And we'll take a look at those bricks in, in a few minutes again. Um, the Delanceys didn't live there long. The area quickly became a commercialized area and they moved on. Um, the area where Delancey Street is today was their farm, the Delancey Farm, but they lived other um, in another location in colonial New York City. Now the, the property changed hands a couple of times and in 1726 it was bought by Samuel Francis who called it the Queen's Head Tavern. And you can see um, the building is of traditional Georgian style architecture and is one of only two of those left in Lower Manhattan, the other one being St. Paul's Chapel. Now, for those of you who like to know where you are on a map, here's a map of where we are, and we're at the corner of Pearl Street and Broad Street at the very lower tip of Manhattan Island, or southern tip. Um, we're right near the harbor, the Staten Island Ferry, and Battery Park. And here's a look at those yellow bricks I was talking about. The yellow bricks were originally imported from Holland. They were known as Holland brick. Um, they were very strong bricks, so there are some places in New York where you can still see these bricks. This isn't the only um, example of them, and they were expensive. So whenever you would see a building comprised of these Holland bricks, it would indicate great wealth on the part of the people who built it. So here's a couple more views of the street side. We have on the upper left um, the entrance, which we're going to be walking through in a moment. And here's a view looking over toward Broad Street, the street that rides al runs along the side of the tavern. And here's the Francis Tavern um, plaque showing that it is on the National Register of Historic Places. So let's walk through that open door. And the first thing we see on our left is a plaque telling us that the current building was purchased by the Sons of the Revolution in 19. 1907 and restored. Now photos inside the museum that we're going to see in part two um, will show what a terrible ruin the building was at that time. So it's really incredible that it looks as it does today. Um, it's a wonderful look into the city's rich historic past. So let's head in. Now when we're going to the museum, it's on the upper floors and you can see the steps are, are, are labeled right here, Upstairs Museum. So we're gonna head up the steps and they're old and creaky as we go up. And here's the ceiling, a tin ceiling and chandelier. Um, the tin ceilings date later than Francis Tavern. I think the tin ceilings are 19th century ceilings. So this ceiling would have been added later, um, but it is a beautiful ceiling and very nice chandelier above us. And we're gonna make the left on the stairway. And before you know it, we're at the entrance to the museum. So here we are at the entrance to the Francis Tavern Museum. On the right is where you check in with your tickets. And to the left is the first gallery we're going to visit, the George Washington Portrait Gallery, um, made possible through the generosity of honorary 
past president Stanley DeForest Scott, and that would be president of the Sons of the Revolution. And we have um, a little description of the gallery, um, portraits of George Washington. And when we step in, we're going to see that we are totally surrounded on all sides by pictures of Washington throughout his career as a military officer and as president of the United States of America. So here's the wall to our left and a little bit of the corner and wall behind us. And there are so many portraits of Washington at the time, as you can imagine. Many portraitists wanted to do portraits of Washington only a few were able to do that in person. Now, when I meet people who are really knowledgeable about George Washington, they tend to have a favorite portraitist of him um, and, and tend to not like some of the way um, the other painters depicted him. So we're gonna look at a different, few different views of Washington as we see him in this exhibit. Now here's Washington by Gilbert Stewart, and uh, many of you have probably heard the name Gilbert Stewart as he did paint many important people from the American Revolution and the founding, founding period. Um, Stewart was born in 1755, and um, he was very much looked up to by some of the other artists we're going to see. And so here are two pictures of Washington done by Gilbert Stewart. And remember, there's no photography at that time, so portraits become very important in representing a person throughout the various stages of their life. And as we look around, we take a look at these two, and some of you who really know portrait painters might already know whose portrait these are based on. Um, but when we look at Washington done by different artists as these two are, we often notice that Washington looks the same even though different people have painted him. And uh, there's a reason for that. I hinted at it on our last frame, and that is that demand for pictures of Washington was very high, but only a few painters were lucky enough to have painted him in person. So other artists, in order to make likenesses available to the public, copied the most popular portraits. And the two we're looking at here are taken from a very popular of portrait, very popular portrait, I should say, of Washington, done by Charles Wilson Peel. And the picture on the left is a mezzotint done by Joseph Sabine, and this was done about 100 years later in 1897. And the colored portrait is from London, um, a caricature of Washington. He's holding the Declaration of Independence there, and there are some other aspects of the uh, American Rebellion in the picture. Um, but both of those are based on, and you'll recognize it immediately, this portrait by Charles Wilson Peale. And this is called Washington at the Battle of Princeton, 1779. The first portrait of Washington um, was done in 1772 at Mount Vernon, and it was the only portrait of him done before the Revolutionary War. In total, Peale painted 14 portraits of Washington from life, meaning actual portraits that Washington sat for. And the last one was in 17. Now, the first portrait of Washington known outside of the United States of America was a miniature that Peel painted for Lafayette in 1778. You can imagine that miniatures were popular because there was not photography. So when people wanted to remember someone or Lafayette wanting to carry around an image of his friend Washington, he would ask a painter to do a miniature portrait that he could then carry around with him and a locket or some other type of device. Um, many people had these miniatures made of their family members. And of course, as you can imagine, miniatures of Washington were very popular with the public. So if we take a look again at these other two portraits, you'll see the likeness. So take one last look here at the Peel portrait and we'll look at those other two again. And you can see the face clearly was taken from the Peel portrait. Now, one of my favorite things about Charles Wilson Peel is a portrait he did that's not in the Francis Tavern Museum. It's in the New York Historical Society. And 
this is a portrait of the Peel family that he did. It was uh, painted by Peel and it shows four generations of his family together at the dining table. And he even included his family dog, Argus. Um, this is a picture I took of that portrait um, in the New York Historical Society. He's standing in the back holding the palette and he's looking over the shoulders of his two brothers who were also artists um, who are working on a sketch. So this is a great portrait of uh, the Peel family, one of my very favorite pieces in the collection of the New York Historical Society. Now, if we move on, we see some other types of representations of Washington. Here's an engraving that represents Washington as president of the Society of the Cincinnati. And if you don't know what that is, that was founded after the American Revolution by the officers under Washington's command as a type of brotherhood. And all men descended from those officers um, are eligible for membership today in the Society of the Cincinnati. On the pedestal, it says, first in war, first in peace, and first in the hearts of his country, a slogan about Washington you may have heard before. Now, one of my favorite things in this Francis Tavern collection, I apologize in advance because it was very difficult for me to get a good picture of it because it's wedged in um, at the corner of a wall and to one side is a window and, and right in front of it is a bust and it's very hard to take a picture of it. So I tried my best and um, this is an etching done by John James Barillette in 1802 and it shows Washington being raised from his tomb by immortality and father time and welcomed in to heaven. Um, faith, hope, charity, liberty, and America um, all surround his tomb. Um, America is the woman you see in the forefront with her head in her hands, and behind her you can see um, a spear with a liberty cap on it, and that cap was used throughout artwork in the Revolutionary War to represent the fight for liberty and freedom. I thought this was really beautiful, and I wish I could have got um, a better picture of it for you. And if you visit, please be sure that you take a look at this. It's very large and, and very well done. And of course, I mentioned in front of it is a bust, and here's the bust that is in front of it. Now, the bust um, opposite the etching um, was done in the 18th century. Um, it's actually a replica of an original bust created by Jean-Antoine Houdon, and excuse me, I don't speak any French, in 1786. And that bust is in the Louvre Museum in Paris. So this is a reproduction of that bust. Um, the artist Houdon visited Mount Vernon to meet and study with Washington in person. He and three assistants spent two weeks at Mount Vernon making a mold of Washington's face and taking detailed measurements. Washington himself wrote in some of his personal diaries about this visit and how fascinated he was himself with the creation of the plaster mold of, him, of himself. So um, a reproduction of that French bust here in the gallery. And we also have on display some depictions of Washington as a military commander. And these three happen to be French, all in French, um, depicting him as commander. Um, the left picture is Lexington and Concord. The middle is Washington himself. And on the right represents Cornwallis's surrender at Yorktown. So those are some of the highlights of what we see in the Washington Gallery at the Long Room. The next gallery we come to is the George Clinton Room. And this really, for many years, has been one of my favorite places here in Francis Tavern Museum. Now, George Clinton was the first non-royal governor of New York, meaning the first governor not appointed by a king or queen of England. The portrait over the fireplace was by Ezra Ames and was painted in the early 1800s. Um, George Clinton, for those of you who are interested in politics at the time, was an anti-federalist or a Jeffersonian. And this is... Um, a look at some of the things from his home. And um, let's take a look here. We can see a dining table and the table is set with blue and white Chinese porcelain. And we also see a buffet table with the same blue and white Chinese porcelain set on the table. 
And here's another view of the room with some windows looking out onto Pearl Street. And I'm sure you're getting a look at this wallpaper, which is what we're going to talk about in a moment here. And a close up of some of the china. And if you look at the wallpaper there, it seems to be illustrating an event. And believe it or not, all of the wallpaper in this room is hand painted and is a gift of the Clinton family to the museum. And let's take a closer look at it. Um, this scene in the wallpaper seems to illustrate um, a Revolutionary War victory. Um, let's see if we can get even a little closer to this. And here it looks like this is Washington and his officers arriving um, to some sort of celebratory event. So I don't know if this is depicting Washington at the end of the war or exactly what it is. There isn't any real detailed description of the of the wallpaper in the museum, but this beautiful hand painted wallpaper on all four sides, um, or I should say all three sides of the room as we view it. And before we leave the Clinton room, a look at the um, lovely and colorful carpet. And then right opposite the Clinton room is the room we all came here today to see. The entrance to the long room. Now, because of copyright reasons, I'm not able to show you details of the restoration of the long room. There are items on display for this exhibit for which Francis Tavern does not have reproduction rights. So I'll be showing you some views that don't show you the table as it's set. But if you visit Francis Tavern or you go to their website, uh, francistavernmuseum.org, you'll be able to see a bit of what that set table looks like. Now, when we walk in, for me, I just can't believe we're standing in the long room. It's really incredible to be standing in this very room where General Washington gave his farewell address to his assembled officers at the end of the Revolutionary War. It was December 4th at noon, and it's so exciting and unbelievable that I am in the same room where Washington, General Knox, General Green, Colonel Talmadge, and many more had their final meal together. It just really is overwhelming if you just stand here and close your eyes and try to imagine what it was like. They were victorious. They started out in 1775 fighting against Great Britain for their freedom. And here they were now in 1783 victorious. It must have been an incredible feeling for them this very room where they had their last meal together. And this would also be the last time that all of them would be gathered together in the same place. Now the room has recently been redesigned to be more accurate to the way it was on that day. And here's another bit of a look at it, also just showing you some of the windows and a cupboard. And to the left, you can see a bit of the fireplace that was there. And they do have a number of exhibits explaining to you the importance of the tavern and the long room itself. Um, if you want to see it all, it is well worth the price of admission. Francis Tavern only charges $7 a ticket. So it is worth far more than that, I think. Now here's um, a welcome to the long room telling us a little bit about the history of the long room and Samuel Francis. And you can also see here an engraving from 1777 showing four men sitting in a tavern together. Tavern life was incredibly important at the time. Um, they weren't not only places where you would eat and socialize with your friends, but in the years leading up to the Revolutionary War, you would find members of the New York Sons of Liberty here in the Queen's Head Tavern, planning their protests and writing their broadsides and handbills. Organizing against the Crown and Parliament was done in taverns throughout the colonies, and you might also know that the United States Marine Corps was founded in a tavern in Philadelphia. So integral to American colonial life, taverns. And I think New York City, in the years of the Revolutionary War, had 14 taverns and coffee houses, places where the public could meet and gather and socialize. And we have another 
exhibit here about Washington's farewell and evacuation day. Now, if you haven't already seen it, check out my video all about evacuation day, November 25th, 1783, the day the British finally left the city of New York. And that will explain to you the whole celebratory atmosphere and what was happening in New York around that. Now, about a week later was when Washington invited his officers to dine with him one last time here in the long room. And they have for us to hear a recording of what he said to them. With a heart full of love and gratitude, I now take leave of you. I most devoutly wish that your latter days may be as prosperous and happy as your former ones have been glorious and honorable. I cannot come to each of you, but shall feel obliged if each of you will come and take me by the hand. And here is a painting of that event. So as told by Colonel Benjamin Talmadge, they met at noon and they all ate together quietly. And at the end of their dinner, Washington rose and uh, recited the words um, that you just heard, thanking them all for their years of service and hoping that their futures are all bright and prosperous. Um, Washington asked each of them to come and take him by the hand or shake his hand, as we might say, um, rather than him doing it himself as he was too tired to go around the room. And this painting, a very popular painting, um, shows Washington embracing one of his officers while many of the others weep with sorrow. So if we think about it, after many years of companionship, they're saying goodbye to each other and to the man who mentored and led them. Some of these officers began their service as very young men, only 19 or 20 years old, and now seven or even eight years have gone by, and they're saying goodbye to this gentleman who was not only their commander and mentor, but in many ways a father figure. Also keep in mind that at this time, people didn't travel long distances just for pleasure. So many of these men, including Colonel Benjamin Talmadge, who is the gentleman pictured on the left with his hand over his face in sorrow, believed they would never lay their eyes on their commander again. Um, those men who were returning to their homes in New England or New York, Washington returning to Virginia, was highly unlikely they would ever see him again. To the right is a newspaper account of the events that was published in the New York Independent Journal of December 8, 1783. Colonel Talmadge tells us in his, in his memoir of the event that when he gazed out of the window onto Pearl Street, he noticed that thousands of people had gathered in the area there called the Exchange. And when he told the general about it, they agreed that General Washington should walk through the crowd and honor them for coming to honor him. And uh, Colonel Talmadge says they then formed an honor guard around the commander as he walked through the cheering crowd on Pearl Street. They turned onto Broad Street through the crowd and there behind Francis Tavern at the time was a slip with a ship anchored there, or I think really it was a barge anchored there, um, and that they helped him um, board the barge. Um, he said that Washington then sat on the barge and stoically waved goodbye to the people of New York as that barge took him out to his ship and that that was the last time they believed they would ever see him again. Also on display in the museum, um, what I thought was the most incredible thing I saw all day was this. This is the actual, <clears throat> excuse me, original handwritten memoir of Benjamin Talmadge. This to me was the most stunning item on display in the entire museum. Maybe that's because I have spent so much time over the years reading over it again and again and again, and because I have such great respect for Colonel, later, later Congressman Talmadge. And here is a close up of his handwriting. And people today are always so impressed with penmanship of that time. Um, remember, of course, that people practice their penmanship because communication was all through written letters. So it was important that you were able to express yourself, not only verbally, but also in your handwriting. Now, I bet about a lot of you know that um, Talmadge was from a town in New York called Setauket on Long Island, and he graduated from Yale College with his friend, Nathan Hale. 
After Nathan Hale was hanged as a spy in 1776, Talmadge set out to create a better way to spy on the British forces. He used his friends in Setauket, where the British had an important base, to send him vital information. The ring eventually expanded to New York City, uh, Manhattan Island, and it is known today as the Culper Spy Ring. And some of you have probably seen the um, TV series Turn, Washington Spies, that is based on the operations of the Culper Spy Ring. After the war, Talmadge went on to serve in the United States Congress, and uh, as I said, this is a close-up of his handwriting on, of the page detailing the event that took place in the long room. And also in another gallery that we'll see in part two of this video is a um, statue of Nathan Hale. So speaking of Nathan Hale, um, this is his statue in the Sons of the Revolution Gallery, which we'll be visiting in our next video, um, which I'll have out for you next week. Please excuse the noise. Construction is going on around my home, and that, that's outside, so please excuse that. So this finishes our view of Francis Tavern Museum Part 1. And as we exit, we head down those creaky old stairs. And toward the bottom of the stairs on display, we find a replica of one of Washington's pistols. And take a look at the beautiful artistry and workmanship and the close-up of this. Is that wonderful? On the right is a horse, and we see some cannon, um, some flags, also a lion there. Very beautiful workmanship um, on that on that pistol. So very beautiful. And there's the close-up. And on our way out, well, there's the ground floor restaurant on the way out. In part two, we'll visit the Sons of the Revolution Gallery, the Sons of Liberty Gallery, and the Historic Flag Gallery. Thank you so very much for joining me, and I will see you in part two.